Well, we're going to start, you yeah. know. Uh, Dr. Hicks, where, where are you from? Baltimore. And where were you born? Here, right here in Baltimore. In West Baltimore? In West Baltimore. And where did you go to grade school? I went to a school, a little elementary school on Pennsylvania Avenue and uh, Pressman Street, which and, is now torn down. And <laughs> it's like my grade school, they're all gone. Yeah, that one only went to the fifth grade. Then I went to 104 on Pennsylvania Avenue, which was next to St. Peter Claver Church. And of course, that's torn down too. And um, what did your dad do? My father worked for a national biscuit company, Nabisco, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a foreman. And how about mom? Mom didn't work. Stayed home with the kids. How many siblings were in the family? It's five of us. So somewhere along the line, you ended up going to Morgan. I went to Morgan. I went Morgan at the time I went was Morgan State College, and it was a Methodist school private Methodist school. And so I went to Morgan uh, on a, as because I was part of Methodist Church at, on a scholarship. And where was it located then, Morgan? It was the same place. The buildings are, set, are still there. They're just old. I, it wasn't but four or five buildings. <laughs> it was so small. There were maybe 1,100 students altogether. There were no weekend classes, no evening classes all day. And this is in the early 50s? Yeah, went in 1951. Mm -hmm. And what was it like living in a segregated Baltimore City in the 50s? Well, it was horrible. It was always horrible. Even though I was born in the, I was born 306 Pressman Street. So I was used to going to Pennsylvania Avenue. And I had an aunt that lived even closer, my mother's oldest sister. And I would go up there. She had a lot of I had a lot of second cousins to go up there and first cousins to play with. And even though it was part of the black community, everything was owned by somebody white. And so we had segregation all my life, that's all I've known. And uh, North Avenue was right around the corner, you know, that's a little end of Pressman Street. It's changed now. But North and Linden Avenue used to converge there. So places like Nates and Leon's and all those stores, even though we're right in my back door, I couldn't go in them. And that also went for the transportation system. Like if you wanted to take a streetcar or something. Well, across. I could take a streetcar. Mm -hmm. You could take a streetcar. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that we didn't have problems with riding the streetcar. Then the buses come down in our community. But you could ride the streetcar anywhere and you didn't have to sit any particular place. Uh, the, most of the streetcars, when they got to our community, they were crowded anyway. <laughs> so, we, but, uh, and the buses too. I mean, I could catch the streetcar, which I did, and catch the bus to Morgan. And by the time it got to where I caught it, in front of Reed's, it was packed. People going out to the county for jobs. It was the number three. So they were going out York Road to businesses and uh, So you passed Reed's did. going to school? I, that's how I got involved in it, because I had to stand on that corner and wait for the bus. And you stand there in the wintertime, it's cold, somebody looked it up and said it was 35 degrees, and bus, pack bus after pack bus passes you by, and you're standing there freezing, and it was cold, and I wanted something hot to drink. We all did. It was seven of us. And so I said, let's go and read. Well, they aren't going to serve you. Let's go in and find out. So we just went in and sat down. Uh, it was the shock of their life. They were more shocked <laughs> than anything else. In fact, they were so shocked, somebody said, what did they say? I said, well, we sat there a while before anybody said anything because they didn't, couldn't believe it. They didn't know what to do. They got the manager, and the manager said, you know, you niggas get out of here. You know, we don't serve you. And we just sat there. I mean, we were sitting down, all those heavy books. It was cold. We said, let's stay here till we can't stay here any longer. And then finally, um, he uh, got really belligerent about it. So we decided to get up and leave because we didn't want to get locked up and go two blocks away to Old Pine Street Station, which was the worst police station in the city of Baltimore. So, 
Not to mention the fact I was a senior and I could just see my mother and father. I don't know who would kill me first, the police or them. I'm getting ready to graduate and I get into all this trouble. So we came on to school and we got to school and we went, we had a wonderful dean of students and we went and found him and we told him what we did. And the only thing he said is don't do that without letting somebody know, you know. There's nothing wrong with it, but don't do it like that. You must let somebody know so that we can look out for you, we can protect you. And so it was kind of passed over, except it made the paper. <laughs> it made the sun paper, like two or three lines. So then, of course, everybody knew. And nobody really paid a lot of attention to it, except that we realized that reeds was up in Northwood where we couldn't go either. I had to stand there to catch the bus to come back home uh, after walking a mile because see, they would not bring a bus down the road to Morgan. That was almost a mile walking down that road. And so everybody knew about it. And people, we were trying to use, the students who lived on campus were trying to use that shopping center because they wanted to go in to buy toothpaste, whatever. You know, they wanted to go in Hutchler's, buy clothes, that company. And so they had been picketing off and on to no avail. Well, what it did, it did make the stores open up. What it did was give the students a little bit more, uh, I guess, feeling of I can do this. And so what Reeds did was to, um, because we went back again, <laughs> and they called the school. And the students had started going up to the Reeds in Northwood. So they called the dean and made a big to-do about it, the Reeds company. And uh, they told him, uh, that by, by that time, there were some Hopkins students who were going to pick it with us. They didn't come to the Reeds downtown. The man in the Reeds downtown uh, decided it wasn't worth it because what was happening, we had started picketing all those stores in that block. And it wasn't worth it to him to lose business because people, they opened the stores, you could go in, you couldn't sit at the counters, you couldn't try on clothes, but you could go in and buy. Reads, you couldn't go in, period. It wasn't worth it to him to lose all that business. So he opened the store so we could at least go in and buy. We still didn't eat in there, but we could go. So we went back again, and then he opened it, said it was open. But those stores were individually managed. So the only Reed store that got opened in 1955 was the one that we picked, that we went into in the city. -in. The others we had to keep picketing, and I think it was 1960 before the others, like the one in Northwood, opened up, and they had a big to-do up there. Students went to jail. Judge Bell went to jail picketing up there. <laughs> Who's now the chief judge of the court yeah. of law. Well, so, else. you know, so that, and, and uh, Walter Dean, who went on to be in the, you know, the General Assembly, they got locked up when they went up there, so, uh, because I think they were sick of us. But to remember, this was 55. The Supreme Court had ordered desegregation of schools the year before, 54. So across the country, African Americans were realizing that they had a little bit of power to fight the injustices of segregation. And it caught on, because after we desegregated reeds, as I said, we started desegregating them across the city. Now the manager, the overall manager at reeds, called the school and he was complaining, you, you know, telling Dean Grant, you know, you, your students are in here bothering us again, picking them. They know they can't be served, your students are in here. And so he said, well, if you don't want them in there, you put a sign up that says, no dogs, cats, or Negroes allowed, and they won't come in. And he said, well, I can't do that. Uh, I can't put a sign outside that says, he said, well, put it inside, and they come in, they'll see it. And he says, well, I'm not gonna do it. He said, well, and I'm not gonna tell them to stop coming in. <laughs> 
So we had school support. I remember the president coming down and talking to us. I remember us saying to him, because by then, the NAACP, some of us had already joined. They had a youth branch and they were spreading out to get more young people involved. And they had come to Morgan to try to recruit. And I remember said, we caught him and we said to him, he said something to us about, you're the students who went downtown and created all that ruckus. We said, yes. And we said, do you belong to the NAACP? And he said, no, but come to my office first thing tomorrow morning and I'll join. <laughs> so we had that kind of support. Never reprimanded, you know, Teachers saying, go right ahead. They, they didn't do, say anything in class. You're late for class. No, didn't matter. You know, we were doing what education teaches you to do, make the world a better place to live in. And they were good at that. Now, when you look back on that, you might ask yourself, where did I get the courage to do this and get involved in this? Where did it come from? You, I, I, was it a I, church thing or just... Well, let me just tell you, when I look back on it, for me, now I think for all of us, we did have the church, because remember then the church was bringing students out of Africa to come to Morgan, and out of the Caribbean to come to Morgan, trying to educate African Africans, people of African descent all over the world to come here and get a better life. So we had that kind of impetus from the church. And the church was very involved in the NAACP. But for me, it was because my family had always been involved in protests. And I didn't know any different. My mother and father always said, "You, if you don't stand up for yourself, don't expect somebody to stand up for you. So I had been through all these relatives who had been involved in protests. I tell people all the time, I said, my father's cousin, Russell Sorrell, went after the Civil War, I think the day or two after the Civil War, he went to Washington with the delegation to say to, to uh, Congress, does this apply to free blacks? Or is the, are these rules just related to people who you are freeing now? So that was after the Civil War. So I, I don't know anything else. And I come all the way down, uh, my great uncle, Walter Sorrow, who raised all the ruckus, he and uh, Nathaniel Peck and Joseph Block and all those folks, old, old Baltimore families, about not being able to have any boats or ships down at the harbor. They could unload them, but they had, my, my great-grandfather was a boat builder. So they had all these people with the skill, and they'd make the boats in Virginia. They'd have to sail up under a white flag or, or under white auspices. They couldn't do anything with boats of their own. They had to leave them in Virginia. And so he, they got together, and they put together the uh, only black company, shipping Chesapeake Marine Dry, Dry Dock Company. Well, he was vice president of that, Walter Sorrell. And then he went on to be to get an appointment out of the governor, first appointed black, as far as I know, February 9, 1888, to uh, work at the General Assembly. So I don't know anything else. I can go on and on and say, you know, and in my immediate family, my mother and father who worked with voting rights, who work with uh, breaking up the segregation on Pennsylvania Avenue, my oldest sister, who the recreation center on Gilmore Home, Gilmore, near Gilmore Homes on Gilmore Street, Lillian Jones Rec Recreation Center, named after her because she fought because there was no recreation center in that area. And she fought to get a recreation center in that area, which still stands today. So I'm saying I have, I don't know anything else. We were always taught, you know, you can't right or wrong by screaming and hollering about it. You have to go out, you go out and do it. You want it done, you do it. And my father used to tell this tale. My great-grandfather was on the stage. So I guess a lot of the humor came in because he was a ventriloquist. 
And so a lot of the humor came in because of that kind of, you know, stuff. And I had a cousin who was also on the stage. So that fun in the family. And he would always tell this tale about, they said, isn't that a shame? Somebody should do something about that. Isn't that a shame? Somebody should correct that. And he used to always say, to somebody is you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you are the somebody. <laughs> if you see it's wrong, you do something about it. And don't worry, others will follow. And yeah. they sure have. So when you look back now at your involvement in that, in the reeds that sit in, and you look back at what's happened over the years to the African American community, what are, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are that first of all, I think we've slipped. There's always, uh, and this comes from years of experience and knowledge, this is no, no inherited wisdom, but just from watching the world, of what has happened in the world. There's always an upside and a downside. The downside of desegregation was that it made many African Americans forget that they were not truly free the things that were fought for in the early years would rise again unless they fought to keep them in place. So they became all kinds of uh, important people in the world, but they did not remember, and especially in this country, in this city, they did not remember who they were and what their basic commitment to self was. You know, you know that lesson, it strikes a chord because I think it, it could apply to the labor movement. Yes. And back in the 30s and 40s, they won all these wonderful rights, you know, the eight hour day, time and a half, and 40 mm -hmm. hour week, and health benefits and all that. And then somehow, some of them have forgotten that. John Sweeney told me that 25% of the AFL CIO are Republicans. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and you just have to wonder the memory thing. They, it, it, they didn't live through it, and they don't know it. So it's not foremost in their mind. Yeah. The other thing desegregation <clears throat> did was that it not only pushed that memory, but it, it, didn't, it, it did not go far enough in terms of making sure that we taught kids that in school, the lesson of civil rights. So African Americans do not know civil rights history. They don't know it as recently as 10 or 20 years ago. University of Maryland School of Social Work called me up, asked me would I come and talk to them about Reed's. Sure, I'll come. And they said, uh, uh, you know where the school is and all. I said, I know where it is, but I have to tell you I've never been in it. They said, didn't you do social work? I said, when I, in 1958, the University of Maryland did not admit African Americans. I said, I want you to know the university, uh, this, this state, because it was state university, paid for all of us to go to Howard University to go mm -hmm. to school rather than let us come in that school and mix with mm -hmm. white people. <laughs> all those thousands of dollars <clears throat> were spent to educate us at Howard University because they didn't want us there. So no, I don't know anything about it because I had no reason to go in there. They, didn't, they never wanted me there. And that's as late as 1958. 1958. So it hasn't finished. And I told them, I said, when I got my doctorate from University of Maryland College Park, I had a fight to get it, to get degreed because I had a one professor on the advisory staff that quizzes you on your dissertation. He, I had written it on black apprentices. He refused to read it. So that meant that I didn't have a complete team. I could, even though I was Phi Beta Kappa, <laughs> I could not graduate. What had to happen was that my advisor had to find an African American on that campus who would agree to sit in on my dissertation series or trial or whatever they call it in order for me to graduate. You know when that was? 1987. Delayed. 
1987. So I say to students, I say to people, black and white, you know, I say, you, you only have rights for the moment they're granted. If you want to have them forever, you got to keep fighting forever. Easy come, easy go. It didn't easy come, really, but I mean, they will give them to you, but they will just as quickly take them away. Give them just one little opening, and they're gone. 